Welcome to Star Trek Story, Myth, and Arcs Podcast. It's five-year mission to explore Star Trek arcs and themes, seek out new story directions, and boldly tell stories that no one has told before. Hailing frequencies open, sir. Okay, welcome to Star Trek Story, Myth, and Arcs. And tonight I have a special guest. And uh, this guy to my left on your screen, if you're watching, uh, is Jeff Burke. And Jeff and I have a long uh, working relationship because he was my editor at Dead Eye Press. And um, so he and I have developed books together. And uh, But one thing that we have in common is we are both totally huge Star Trek nerds. And Jeff is very excited to talk about this topic, which our topic today is Star Trek and horror. We are not the first ones to realize that Star Trek is pretty much a horror show. And uh, in fact, Bloody Disgusting even did an article that said um, Star Trek was groundbreaking horror um, in the 60s, which it was. And um, if anybody listened to the last episode that I did, we talked about the writers of the Twilight Zone. And that's one thing that the Star Trek and the Twilight Zone shared is a whole shit ton of actual horror writers who, uh, if there had been an HWA at the time, a Horror Writers Association, they would have all been in it. But this was pre-HWA. So anyways, Jeff, why don't you just introduce our listeners to your relationship with Star Trek and how you got into Star Trek and what's oh, your favorite track? Oh, man, my relation to Star Trek, um, I guess I'm best known as being the author of Shatner Quake and also it's and pseudo-sequel sequel Shatner Quest. Um, I uh, kind of wrote two really stupid books about William Shatner that uh, have their own cult followings, but that's not really why I'm here today. Why I'm here today is to talk about how awesome Star Trek is and its relationship to horror. Mm -hmm. And But um, listen, I think our, our listeners would be very excited to know that you wrote a book about um, a, uh, a multiverse explosion where a bunch of William Shatner's oh, characters... Oh. All, All right, so so let me give my pitches um, of my two Star Trek related books. So my first book was Shatner Quake, which is about the first ever Shatner Con with William Shatner as the guest of honor. And after a failed terrorist attack by Campbellians, which is a cult that worships Bruce Campbell, Every character that William Shatner has ever played gets sucked into our reality, and their goal is to kill the real William Shatner and replace him. Mm -hmm. And then I wrote a second William Shatner book. It's not actually a sequel, but it revolves around William Shatner, and that one is called Shatner Quest, and the basic premise of that is a science fiction club is in Baltimore, Maryland, and the apocalypse happens. And the apocalypse is everything from science fiction, horror, and fantasy media all becomes real. And so there's all these monsters roaming all about everywhere and aliens, all sorts of crazy shit. And the science fiction club takes it upon themselves to travel from Baltimore to Los Angeles to save William Shatner because if they don't, who will? Right. And so those are those are my two big like like so I wrote I have five books out and two of them are themed around William Shatner and Star Trek. And I'm not sure how good of the stream this is coming in right now. I can't really quite tell my side, but I also have, for everyone viewing at home, I also got the Star Trek tattoo on my chest. I'm officially part of the Federation. For the record, that communicator tattoo does not work. I have tried it. No one answers. Um, 
And then also to further elaborate on why I'm here on this podcast, uh, David Agrinoff is an incredibly talented writer who I have had the extreme fortune of working with on numerous titles. Um, Thank you, Jeff. Vegan Revolution with Zombies, Boot Boys of the Wolf Reich, uh, Ring of Fire, um, I, I do believe I'm forgetting one or two. Oh, probably Punk Rock oh, Ghost Story. Oh, Punk Rock Ghost Story. My God, how could I forget that? Because it, you know, it brings all the monsters together. But David and I have known each other and worked together on the horror end for m over a decade now at this point. Or, yeah. or maybe it's approaching a decade at this point that we we've known and have worked together on horror. And we're both super nerds when it comes to Star Trek and Star Trek's place in the uh, um, genre history of um, fantasy, horror, and science fiction. Yeah, and so when I started this podcast, you were one of the people that I wrote down that I knew I was going to have to have on the show. And I've been so excited to be on here, and I've listened to every one of the previous episodes, and I'm so excited to be here. I appreciate um, that, man. And what was, the, what was the first episode interview you did with the um, guy he wrote for Deep Space Nine and also oh, did the Star Trek? John Ordover, editor at Pocket Books for the he, That episode blew my mind because I, I just want to shout out for everyone like listening to this right now. That dude wrote some seriously amazing Star Trek novels. And I'm not really well, a... Actually, um, he didn't Except write. He didn't write many of the novels. He was just the editor. He oversaw. Oh, all of them. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Well, he had a brilliant mind in overseeing the ideas that ne yes. needed to go into those novels. Yeah. And I'm not really a big extended universe guy, which are probably going to come up in our conversation here later. But I fucking love what he did with the. Um, invasion storyline and day of honor like that really blew my mind that he was uh involved and oversaw that so i feel really honored to be here and it, well i mean you had a similar job with dead eye you oversaw over 100 horror novels pretty yes. much and, yes. and and so i'm sure you could kind of also understand a little bit about what he was going through uh, oh but, very much yeah yeah as as an as an editor and speaking of, and, and um, I'm more of a fan of Shatner Quest than I am Shatner Quake because I think you were trying harder. Thank but you so much. Shat I, I recommend that everybody read Shatner Quest. Shatner Quake sounds cooler. Shatner Quest is actually the good book. Yeah, and hopefully one day you'll write Ooh, Hurricane and <laughs> uh, we can complete the trilogy. Or, and, or, or uh, Sunimoy? <laughs> Sunimoy, yes. Yeah, I forgot about Sunimoy. Um, <laughs> obviously, we... we we have talked about this before, um, and uh, um, <laughs> Jeff, uh, I'm just really glad to have you. But let's get to the topic, which is yes. uh, Star Trek and horror. Um, now, one of the things that is underrated is, is the fact that horror is the backbone of really the original series um, in, in the fact that, and for nothing else, the very first episode to air was a vampire episode with the man. Yeah. And not only a vampire episode, but it was written by George Clayton Johnson, who is famous for having written one of the most popular ever Twilight Zones, Kick the Can. But more importantly, he was also the writer of Logan's Run, co-writer with William F. Nolan of the original Logan's Run, which isn't horror, but nonetheless, I, I... George Clayton Johnson was a horror writer and, and, and wrote very many horror concepts. And the man trap, starting off the entire series with a salt vampire, is um is is pretty interesting that it it all started with horror. I don't know, I don't know what do you think about the man trap? Well, um uh yeah, that's one of the things I've kind of been like really excited to talk about this of talking about Star Trek and horror is um you actually re directly related to that question. You actually asked me another question earlier that I want to backtrack to because it all ties around about how I got into Star Trek. Mm -hmm. In that um, it actually wasn't an original series I got into at first. It was uh, Deep Space... I'm sorry, it wasn't Deep Space Nine. It was Next Gen. Uh, yeah. Deep Space Nine is where I got super hooked. But it was uh, Next Gen. And in fact, I know the very first Next Gen 
episode, um, the very first episode I ever saw. And I saw on the night it aired, was, which was October 25th, 1993. I was seven years old. So now everyone knows how old I, I was. But it was the next gen episode, Phantasms which if you don't recognize that episode uh, just by its name, it's the one where Data starts having nightmares. And the opening of it is Data walking through the uh, Enterprise and he's having hallucinations with um, another Data that has like... Uh, Oh, I'm, I'm probably mixing this up a little bit in my head of the scenes, but it has like the um, the data with the phone inside his chest and also mm. the data wearing the weird mask. This is all that same episode. I had never seen an episode of Star Trek before. I was seven years old. And what's really interesting is my parents actually actively discouraged me from watching children's media. So I didn't watch children's cartoons growing up or anything like that. Instead, I watched like B horror movies and B science fiction movies. And my first exposure to Star Trek was my mom was at work. I grew up in a single parent household um, with my grandparents and my mom had to support both myself and my grandparents. So she had to work late into the night every night. Mm -hmm. And the first Star Trek episode I ever saw was this weird, scary, actually, like, it's not really a horror episode, but in my seven-year-old brain, mm -hmm. I interpreted it as a horror thing and it freaked the fuck out of me. And I was so fascinated by what this show was. And so I kept watching it and um in fact i didn't know the original series existed because so this was in uh 1993 october that i had seen um this first episode of star trek and i kept watching them and my mom was not aware and then my mom was really into going to the movies and she liked taking me to the movies and it would have been around November of 94. November of 94, my mom asked me, um, do you want to go see a movie? And I was like, yes, I want to see Star Trek Generations. <laughs> and um, she was just like, what? Why, why, why do you want to go see Star Trek Generations? And she had no idea that I had been watching uh, next gen and through next gen I had gotten into original series uh, episodes and that in 94 this was uh, next gen and original series crossing over for the first time and my mom having to work late at night had no idea that I was getting into Star Trek and it turns out she was an old school Star Trek fan. So you cannot imagine how thrilled good. she was to find out that her son, without any effort on her part whatsoever, was turning mm -hmm. into a Star Trek nerd. And she took me to see Star Trek Generations uh, opening night. And um, she had been, uh, essentially her and I have gone to Star Trek conventions through up until right now, where unfortunately I can't go visit her due to pandemic and travel's not happening. But then tying it back around to about like how I feel about Star Trek starting in horror is um, uh, my mom's also like a big horror fan. Like she really got me into like those like old school, like I said, I didn't watch children's cartoons growing up. I was watching like 1950s. Uh, like them and the brain that wouldn't die and Twilight Zone like oh my god fucking Twilight Zone it was like my shit as a little kid that she had me watching and then seeing the original Star Trek series when I was a little kid and also Next Gen and really in a lot of its best forms Star Trek has kept us up which is what I really kind of love about Star Trek and has it as a really great science fiction media is that when encountering these new things, they're always horrifying at first mm -hmm. because 
in reality, us as humans encountering something that we have no perspective for, that's going to be scary. That's going to be terrifying. Well, and then, and in, in that regard, I, I'm thinking of the episode Devil in the Dark, which is about yes, the Horda. Yes, yes, that's actually very much what I was thinking of as well. Yeah, because the Horda eventually, you know, after the starts communicating with Spock and that excellent mind meld scene in the no kill eye and all that. But before that, the Horda is terrifying. It's like eating through rock. It's burning people up. It's destroying people. It's, it's consuming them. And then the message is you're killing its children and you didn't even realize it, which is great Star Trek. And it's so great. Yeah. And it's great horror. And it's making use of the fact that, um, you know, our special effects budget amounts to like a, a, a it looked like a bunch of matzahs, like matzah uh, bry. That's a Jewish reference. That's not going to go for anybody. I'm, anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm yeah. very unfamiliar with Jewish references, so I don't get it. Looks it looks like a big pile of just junk and this I mean, it does. Worst special effect ever. But it didn't matter because it told the story. Oh, dude, when I was, like, fucking seven years old, like, I was totally sold on it. And I was, like, totally gripped in and horrified. And I just want to bring up, like, um, we were talking about this a little bit before the show started. Like, what I really adore about Star Trek is the same thing that I really adore about Doctor Who. And that both they're 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 not afraid of mashing together genres and they both very much approach um take on the approach that when being confronted with things outside of our realm of understanding they're very horrifying and scary at first but what we need to do as human beings is try to understand them and like like, that's what makes Star Trek and Doctor Who, to me, very optimistic, very hopeful viewpoints of the world. I always, like, I know we're about to talk about, like, Star Trek and horror, but I'm a, also a very political person, as, as you are as well, David. Mm -hmm. And I always like to ex explain my political philosophy is essentially whatever gets us closest to Star Trek. Because it's sometimes really scary getting yeah. there. And so I think that horror aspect is kind of appropriate because it's sometimes very scary crossing over those, um, you know, those bridges. Well, and keep all your thoughts on what gets us closer to Star Trek for later because that's going to be our uh, separate show. Oh, uh, yes, we've talked about this. There's a little hint to everyone listening. We've been talking about something exciting. On that note, yeah, but that's probably going to be a couple of people. But let's take on uh, horror and Star Trek. Let's let's... On, yeah, let's take on horror. Let's get back to – now, for me, yes. a difference in our age is the fact that um, I only had original series when I was a little kid, and I was getting into it. Um, I watched Next Gen Pilot as it came on. Um, I, I hate to admit the fact that I was in college when Generations came out. Um, oh, shit. Oh, how much older are you of me? Uh, um Enough that I was in college, a freshman year of college, when, <laughs> when Generations came yeah, out. Yeah, I, I, I was eight when Generations came out. Right. So, anyways, uh, so, on that horrifying note, um, <laughs> the, the man trap, uh, starting yes. off the series with a vamp with a salt vampire was really yes. incredible. And that was George Clayton Johnson, who we talked about had the Twilight Zone history. But... He was not the only Twilight Zone writer who wrote for Star Trek and um, probably one of the greatest 20th century science fiction and horror writers that crossed genres was Richard Matheson. And, and Richard Matheson wrote only one episode for Star Trek, but it was an important one called The Enemy Within. And what he did, too, was take another horror trope and put it into Star Trek, where he did the Jekyll and Hyde story. Yes. Um, by splitting uh, Bill Shatner into two, um, way ahead of you. Uh, <laughs> only two, though. Uh, but uh, Richard Madison did this. With <laughs> you know what? I've never made that connection before. Holy shit. Okay, thank you for well, that. Well, yeah, I, I seem to recall that when you wrote Shatner Quest, 
didn't doesn't he doesn't both shatter both Shatner's from um, that episode are in the book, right? No, no not technically. Um, uh, cartoon Sh yeah, Well, there's Cartoon Shatner and there's Captain Kirk, and they both okay. appear separately. Though, I seem um, to recall that we had dinner some... I think it was at Hungry Tiger, and I called bullshit that both Kirk's from the Enemy Within should have been there. I remember having a... Oh, oh you person. probably... You, you almost certainly did. And <laughs> I do remember us being a Hungry Tiger uh, many times. <laughs> so you almost certainly did. Okay. Right. So that episode... So if we were to talk about this episode, mm -hmm. I love Richard Matheson. I cannot express this enough. His episodes of The Twilight Zone are some of my favorite episodes. Um, the Haunting of... Hell House is one of my House, yeah. absolute favorite horror novels of all time. I am legend, incredible. Yeah, we should explain. I'm, Some people. I'm really sorry. I do not like the enemy within. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I think it's a really I don't bad think it's episode. The best episode. But but it is really crucially important for the connection to horror because. Um, for one thing, Richard Richard Matheson not only wrote Kolchak the Night Stalker, he wrote yeah. I Am Legend, Hell House. Um, he was the Incredible Co Shrinking Man. Um, yeah. um, I I Am Legend. Yeah, he was also a Twilight Zone writer. I'm sure, also off the top of our heads, forgetting like another half dozen major things. Richard Matheson, for anyone that's listening that is unaware, is one of the biggest, most important important genre writers that you most likely have never heard of. And he is Well, you've definitely heard genius. of his work. Most yes, people, yes. Like, when you say I am legend, or you say somewhere in time, or you, you point out what he... Oh, what he a of. stir of echoes, stir um, of what echoes. dreams may come, like... Yeah. yeah, and people should go out and read Richard Matheson, but um, I do have a quote from him about, um, about writing this episode because it was funny because... Um, they what they did is they one of the reasons why um, Matheson didn't come back is he didn't have a really great experience writing for Star Trek. They wrote a B storyline that had nothing to do with him, and then his exact quote was, um, "And by the way, keep in mind that Matheson was already friends with Bill Shatner. Bill Shatner actually hung out with the group." The, oh the, no, sh I did not. I did not know that. Yeah, um, in fact, he had um, written. He wrote episodes for Star Trek that he workshopped with the group. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, and, and, and so in all the, if you see all these interviews with George Clayton Johnson and Richard Matheson, they always refer to Shatner as Bill because they were friends with him beyond yeah. the fact that, and Richard Matheson wrote, or uh, um, William Shatner was in both Richard Matheson's episodes of The Twilight Zone, or uh, Bill Shatner's episodes of The Twilight Zone. Matheson wrote both of them. He, so, so he wrote uh, a terror at a uh, forty thousand feet, of course, and he also wrote um, Nightmare was it, at uh, twenty thousand, uh, yeah, uh, Nightmare at twenty uh, forty thousand, Nightmare at twenty thousand feet, and the other one is was it a penny for your mind? Yeah, something like that. I, I don't remember that one. But but the one, but the one with the uh, penny fortune. Yeah, yeah, and Matheson yeah. wrote both those. So he said, my script stayed entirely with Bill Shatner having his trouble with the two selves on the ship. They added the whole subplot with the people down on the planet ready to freeze because they have a transporter functioning problem. But I stuck entirely with Bill. So, um, and one of the things is, if you look at the at, at the, the writing history, is um, a lot of these big name science fiction writers wrote treatments and episodes for um, Star Trek, but they were heavily rewritten because Gene Roddenberry, DC Fontana, Gene Kuhn, they, they didn't believe that these writers understood the characters as well as they did. And so a lot of times they went through heavy, heavy rewrites. And so what's interesting is if you look at these two episodes by George Clayton Johnson and, um, and Richard Matheson that are in the first season, that they play with classic horror tropes. You've got your vampire, you've got your Jekyll yeah. and Hyde. And um, George Clayton Johnson said that his first script version was very much about the man trap being the very last of its kind, right? Which is hinted at in the episode, but that was the entire storyline was, um, even though this thing is a monster, we can't kill it because it's the last of its kind. Yeah, which is something that Star Trek has kept through still to the modern day, that no matter how uncomfortable it must be, we must preserve 
mm -hmm. life, which is something that on a very personal level, I find very inspiring from Star Trek. Right. And um, so uh, George Clayton Johnson felt that they did kind of um, weaken that aspect of the story for the final episode. And um, there, uh, there was much more um, of uh, McCoy storyline in there, which was interesting because he wasn't even, he didn't even get um, starring by credit until like 13 episodes in and they weren't like entirely convinced that Bones was going to be like the major character that he became because they weren't totally sold into Forrest Kelly at that point. And, um, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, so those two episodes, I think playing with the horror tropes is, is really good. But we really want to talk about horror tropes in season two. Um, Robert Block. That's why I have, I, I have a lot of thoughts on this. I was really, really looking forward to talking about the, the three Robert Block episodes. The three Robert Block episodes. Now, one was in the first season, which we talked yep. about that, and that was What Little Girls Were Made Of, which yep. is another double Shatner episode because we have an android Shatner. Which also, I want to say that episode is so notorious because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, that's also the episode where um, the meme of Shatner holding the penis rock yeah, comes from, it comes from yes. the rubber block. It, it, it's not, but it's it, it's we we can probably get more detail on this as you go on. But I kind of love its premise in the overall scope of Star Trek. But the episode itself is really fucking boring and really poorly done. Yeah, it's not a great episode. It's not one of the best episodes. But, but I love the idea of it. The yeah. idea is so cool. And one really important thing in this episode that Robert Block brings to this, and everyone should know that Robert Block, besides being the author of Psycho and most well-known for having written Psycho, he also wrote yes. tons of horror, but he also wrote a lot of Lovecraftian horror. And not only did he write Lovecraftian horror, but he lived in Wisconsin and he traded letters as a young man with one Howard Phillips Lovecraft. So, um both of us, both uh, David and myself, have been official guests multiple times at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival. So mm -hmm. just to back up what David is saying, um, Robert Block is actually like the last of the original Cthulhu Mythos Lovecraft circle because he was the youngest of it. He was a yeah. part of um, like like that old school horror thing and he was like a teenager correct me if i'm wrong he was like a teenager in high school when he was first approaching a lot of the writers in that circle yeah well you know on, on, on an episode of dickheads we were interviewing uh betsy wilheim whose father she actually pulled out a letter that she a handwritten letter that lovecraft had written her father and just to see, like, wow. <laughs> that out, I was like, whoa, that's crazy. But that's, it, yeah, that's insane. So why is this important? Because in What Little Girls Are Made Of, there is a mention of the old ones, which is Lovecraftian. And it is a tiny little connection to the Lovecraft, Lovecraft mythos that Robert Block snuck oh. into. I, I want to jump in here. It's not a tiny little connection. I, um, in preparation for this, um, uh, this recording, I've rewatched almost every one of the episodes that we're going to be talking about here in the past week. And it's not a little mention. It's over the entire episode that the planet they are on, they are on, is a dilapidated city planet that the great old ones were there in the past and everything has been lost and essentially nobody knows what that means and I'm sure you're going to bring this up that Robert Block also mentioned the old ones in another Star Trek episode uh, yes he did um, well and, he, he wrote two other ones and, and we're going to segue to Cat's gonna, Paw the uh, old ones do get mentioned in Cat's Paw that's right, and let's talk about Cat's Paw because Cat's Paw is really important, and I just rewatched Cat's Paw last night. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it, oh, it so, so, so does I. Uh, Cat's Paw is just insane. 
it is just insane. It, it, and it's one of those episodes that's good for not being good for, for being. Yeah, I don't think so. So the but, three. Oh, 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 wait, but let me let me just okay. point out before okay. we get into Cat's Paw that it is significant that Robert Block was just chosen to write this episode because yes. this was a Halloween episode and this yes. was airing near Halloween and it was considered the Halloween episode of Star Trek and it was written to be that and what's really interesting and for those of you who are watching on YouTube can kind of see um, this is the cover for super science fiction from December of I believe 1947 uh, and it features also a story by Isaac Asimov but that story by Robert Block in there is called the boom uh, the broomstick ride and what's really funny about robert block in his episodes is robert block just straight up takes his old short stories and and sells them to star trek and repurposes stories that he wrote for magazines and so cat's paw was based on a non star trek story about a spaceship landing on some random planet um, and have, and finding a castle and the Meth Macbeth witches and all the things that happen in this episode. So, so in Cat's Paw, they land on a planet. There's the three witches from Macbeth. There's um, a castle and black cats. And um, Kirk has the awesome line of saying, if I didn't know better, I'd say somebody's pulling a trick or treat on us. And he has, and it, it, is an awesome scene where he has to explain to Spock what trick or treat means, um, and which is great. Although the absolute subtle, the, the greatest moment of Cat's Paw is when they're hanging in the dungeon and there's a skeleton hanging next to McCoy, and and Kurt looks at the skeleton and says bones, and and then he says Doc after he, like he says bones, looks at the skeleton, and then calls him Doc, which he never calls him Doc, right? But because yeah. there's an actual skeleton next to him, he can't call oh, him oh, bones. Oh my god! I don't. You know what? You're fucking rubbing that in my face right now, and I don't think I ever got that till the moment you just said that about how obvious that is. It, well, no, that's I'm, the thing is, I've seen that episode like four times before I got that. That he oh, actually says yeah. Doc after that. It's very subtle, but it is one of the best improvised. Uh, Shatner moments because that is not in the script. Now, that was improvised. No, I'm curious. Um, I've read a, a lot of Robert Block's work, mm -hmm. and I know you have as well. And um, let's ignore yours truly, Jack the Ripper, for, for the moment coming up. But for um, the episodes, what a little girl's made of, and Cat's Paw, which were apparently based off of uh, Queen of the Metal. Men and Broomstick Ride. I have not read either one of those stories. I'm not even sure where those stories are. Have you read them? Do you? Do you I, know I read Broomstick. I read Broomstick Ride uh, in preparation for this because, okay. um, and I called on my um, Philip K. Dick circle to help me track down PDF a uh, PDF of it, and uh, it's okay. I mean. You have to take it for it was written in the 40s. And that's the thing. Yeah. Uh, yours truly, Jack, Jack the Ripper, which is the next one we're going to talk about. Was it was a 1943 story. 1943. So, yeah, yeah you got to kind of take in, you know, um, I grade on a curve when I read some of these, like, classic works. I mean, if you I. Figure, I, I figure World War II was, when he wrote Broomstick Ride, World War II was only two years done. But how, and, how close is Broomstick Ride to... Cat's Paw, because because I, I have to be honest, I've read a lot of Robert Block works, but I've never heard of that story. And I'm a you know obviously big Star Trek fan, big, yeah. big Robert Block fan, but I just I've never heard of it. And trying to look it up, I can't really find like yeah, it's hard to find documentation of these stories. Yeah, it's not a great story. But what I will tell you is that it is mostly the scene with the the Macbeth witches is, is the majority of the story. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a mood kind of tone thing. And it's this idea of, I think he was just kind of trying to write a story about like, wouldn't it be interesting if these, um, 
astronauts landed on this other planet and found like spooky Halloween well, world. It, it was their the Halloween planet episode because you know they did a, the Nazi planet episode and they did yeah. the the uh, gangster uh, planet episode. They, the they, action, yeah, yeah, yeah and, fill in and, the blank. Yeah, and those are really, episodes. you know, I. I have fun with some of these episodes, but they're not my favorites. I like, yeah, you, you know, um, I, I don't think that they're the best, but th at the same time, like, those are things that Star Trek has aged out of by being, by doing most of the um, serialized storytelling that mm -hmm. kind of, that Deep Space Nine um, kind of moved us to. And um, I'm actually excited that I think Strange New Worlds, the Pike show, uh, you know, they're kind of threatening that they're going to, scale back and do some more standalone episodes and i really well, hope that they do well uh let, let's go off to the end of talking about the uh new and upcoming series uh yeah because we we're we're gonna talk at the end about what how we oh, would oh my god work. we we have so much more that we need to talk about and what i really want to talk about since we're on the robert block point is wolf in the fold yeah so wolf in like, the fold for for if anyone hasn't seen it, um, it which is, is one of my favorite episodes, period. No joke. I fucking love Wolf in the Fold. It's insane. It is so crazy. I love it. All right. So and it's the second time in the '60s that it got a TV show treatment, um, which you can watch on YouTube. It was it was can, it was adapted into an episode of. Of Boris Karloff's Thriller, mm -hmm. which is on YouTube, and it's pretty good actually. It's more faithful to the short story. So the short story which goes, is the short story is yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Right, and it is a classic from Weird Tales in 1943. Phenomenal it's, story, phenomenal story. Yes, and it he has done so many versions and sequels and adapted it to two different TV shows that um, I believe it's Subterranean Press or one of the... One I, of the I believe it's Subterranean. Uh, don't hold either one of us to it, but I believe Yeah, so. but there is a book that is just yours, the tr yours truly Jack the Ripper versions. And um, it was also collected in the seminal um, new wave of science fiction anthology edited by Harlan Ellison called Dangerous Visions. But what's really interesting is that... <laughs> Um, in in a in a way that only Harlan's ego could do this, he published yours truly, Jack the Ripper, and then wrote his own story about Jack the Ripper for what he has always wanted to see follow up um, uh, yours yours truly, Jack the Ripper, and wrote a whole thing about how like this is how I wanted it to be done, and uh, it it was weird, but uh, anyways that exists. Um, Harlan Ellison, of course, wrote City on the Edge of Forever for Star Trek fans, um, uh, or wrote the first draft of it, which uh, doesn't resemble um, the, the finished product very much at all. Um, but anyways, uh, Wolf in the Fold is a bananas episode, um, and it, it's one of my favorites. I love it. I love it. It's it so does insane. Not hold up politically very well. Oh, but, okay, that's true. I will not disagree. Yeah, I will not um, disagree. <laughs> that there are some cringy stuff in Wolf in the Fold, uh, but um, the whole idea is is that this spirit creature that's inside Jack the Ripper has been traveling from body to body, and um, I don't know. Like, it, it's kind of questionable whether. Jack the Ripper actually got into Scotty or not, or just, but he, he frames Scotty. No, no, I, 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 I personally interpreted that, um, he got into the body of Scotty and then traveled into Back the, to the Enterprise yeah. because that actually makes thematic sense because Scotty is so connected to the Enterprise He's yeah. the head engineer. 
And so this was a entity that was hopping bodies from people close by. Because remember, it was um, Scotty, if, if I'm recalling it correctly, Scotty had um, interactions with the people in a social bar environment. So there was a friendship there and so it hopped from them into Scotty and so Scotty's friendship is the spaceship the enterprise itself and so the entity then hopped into the enterprise right and uh, the idea that oh my god that's so insane like saying that out loud that's so insane that that's Jack why I love that episode <laughs> Jack the Ripper is actually in the computer of the Enterprise yes. controlling the ship at one point. Jack the Ripper takes over the Enterprise, and the solution is everyone just has to get high. Yes, and everyone does get high. Which, and it works. <laughs> yeah, uh, because it feeds on violence. And um, so one of the things that's really interesting about the Okay, so the short story is about a seance where they... Uh, yes. Yeah, and so the seance scene. Oh okay, yes. So, so for everyone that may not be aware, um, I, I have to admit it's been a long time since I've read the story. Perhaps you can, you're better prefer, prepared than I. Can you can you explain what the basic plot of the original short the story is? The plot of the story is, is very similar. Somebody's accused of 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 these crimes, and um, they use a seance to call out the the spirit of. Jack the Ripper, who they think is 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 possessing these 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 people to to kill, and so um, yeah, it's been a while since I read it too, but um, but it's a story I've read many times, and and um, the um, the actually I, I would say personally I the thriller episode from Boris Karloff is really good, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it doesn't you know I I definitely get the humor of the fact that. Everybody on the Enterprise gets high to, to to save the day, and so that's what everyone has to understand is uh, David and I are very close, long term friends. Uh, David though is a straight edge vegan. I am just a weirdo, um, druggy stunner guy, and so it's very entertaining to me that a solution to like. How do we deal with a serial killer? We just all have to get stoned. Right. And, uh, yeah, I... I, I guess it's like, that, we're dealing with a pandemic work. right now. Actually, like, look at it. It's like a pandemic type of thing that's actually going through because Jack the Ripper is spreading through the ship. It's like a virus thing. And so everyone just has to lock down for a certain period of time and do something they don't really want to do. And... Um, we're kind of existing through that right now. I'm sorry, I'm just like like spitballing, throwing shit out there right now. Well, what's interesting to me is that McCoy was so ready to get 430 people like stoned, like yeah. <laughs> so um, I've always trusted McCoy. Yeah. Uh, so Wolf in the always Fold, trust the doctors. Yeah, Wolf in the Fold is pretty bananas horror, and the fact that it's written by. Uh, Robert Block um, of Psycho. Remember, everyone listening to this, this is a guy that came up with Psycho. Yeah, the man who created Norman Bates wrote this episode. So, One of the most brilliant minds in horror ever. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, I got a lot of respect for Wolf in the Fold, although it's 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 not my personal favorite and um I, I i will be honest i was thinking about like wolf in the fold is probably in my top five favorite original series episodes just because of how insane it is i just love the idea of now now to anyone like gasp me at that i will also say like i put above it um spacey balance of terror and uh triple triple it's just off the top of my head. Those are probably my three favorite episodes. But Balance of Terror. Uh, my top. Yeah, hell's yes. Balance of Terror is just phenomenal. But just though, I've got to be honest, um, as, as David can attest about me, I have a side of me that just adores the trashy side of things. And in terms of trashy Star Trek, Wolf in the Fold is like 
the best it gets as far as I'm concerned. It's pretty trashy. So, um, so let's let's get to some of the other series. So, oh my God, I'm so excited! I have so much to go. Okay, on. Where so, do you want to start? So, with Next Generation, um, yeah, there's lots of horror in Next Generation. There's some like weird, obscure episodes, like that Night Terrors episode where um, that has that incredible. It's not a good episode, but it has the incredible scene where Crusher has the nightmare where all the bodies are are. are Standing up behind her and the oh uh, yes um oh my god I just had that pulled up of what episode it is but yes I know night terrors. I, it's called night terrors I remember oh it's it's called night terrors okay yeah. yes and then there's like weird stuff like nightmare imagery there's the one where Deanna Troy turns into a cake which is super bizarre oh um, oh god yes I yes and then there's uh, Riker's uh, um, alien abduction episode is pretty freaky. Um, but, um, there's one episode that I know you consider to be one of the, the high points of horror in all of Star Trek, and it is the one good spot of the wretched first season of Next Generation. It's the best episode of Next Gen from the first season, and I argue one of the best episodes of Next Gen, period. Which is... Finish me off, David. Well, here's the thing about Conspiracy, because that's the episode you're talking about. Yes, I am. I, I personally feel the first two seasons of Next Gen are worse than anything the original series did. I agree with you completely on that. I yeah. We're on the same page, yes. Yeah, the yeah. first two seasons of Next Gen are rough. So They're rough. rough. But, Conspiracy, which, my only problem with Conspiracy is it should have been a whole season. Like, oh, but you do know that it, they were actually kind of trying to do that. I know, but it was too early. It was before Deep Space Nine made it okay to do And so, now, now for anyone listening to us, uh, now aware of what I'm talking about, uh, so, uh, Conspiracy, which was the, um, oh, I have it pulled up right here. It was the... It was in the first season. It was... It was the 24th episode of the first season. Gotcha. And, um, and, you know, this is back in the time for anyone listening to this, like, yeah, seriously, they used to have that many fucking episodes per... TV season. So, um, Conspiracy was the 24th episode. In the 6th episode of um, Star Trek Next Gen, there was uh, actually... Oh, fuck. I just had this pulled up to make this point all really well. Um, but well, there was... An, for it, right? I mean, I'm sorry, what was that? They planted seeds for Conspiracy. Yes. Well, ahead of time. Yes, there were there was an earlier episode. There was actually the sixth episode of Next Gen, and unfortunately, I know I have it. I, I have too many windows open up right now. <laughs> I'm sorry, everyone. Please forgive me. I'm failing as a Star Trek ultra nerd, and I cannot cite the exact episode. But there was a previous episode they were setting up that there was a conspiracy within the Federation, and then it was the conspiracy episode which brought out the fact that this was going on and it is in my opinion the best episode of the first two seasons of next gen um it's not a, a very high bar though it's really not um i also have a you okay do you and everyone listening want to hear a really cute story <laughs> sure about okay. conspiracy. There's a cute story about I have a really cute story about this. Okay. The same night I saw that episode for the first time uh -huh. was the same night I had my first kiss. Oh, geez. Really? That's yes. crazy. I had my first kiss, and then I saw Star Trek The Next Generation conspiracy episode. That was just a wonderful night that has just kept in my mind to this time well yeah that that is that is that's something that's not something i expected <laughs> so, so let's continue here so, so that episode 
so conspiracy i fucking adore and i think it actually like really shows a lot of the horror potential in star trek and for anyone that hasn't seen it the basic premise of the episode which is actually built up in an earlier episode is that there's some sort of alien infection conspiracy going on within the federation that's attempting to undermine the federation itself and um it's very interesting because the episode it ends on is kind of pinging forward a very bleak future for the federation and it also has um this is 100% true, the first head explosion scene in network television ever was in Star Trek The Next Generation Conspiracy, where both Picard and Riker blow up the alien infestation head, and then we have the alien creature come out and do the roar at them. It's amazing. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but it's crazy, hardcore, violent, gory for network television, even to this day. And um, it's all kind of disappeared. Um, what's really interesting is it was actually meant to be the buildup to the Borg. I'm not sure if you came up, came across in this in your research. Um, yeah. You did not. Okay. Oh, this is so fascinating. So this is why... Um, like, this is the thing that's really hung up with me, is over why did these parasites from Conspiracy get dropped? Because they were built up, actually, over the first season of Next Gen, and um, they got dropped. And the reason why they got dropped is they were actually originally intended to be the build-up to the Borg, for the um, uh, Q Hugh episode in um, that was oh uh, which which season was that season two I believe season two okay it might have yes. been it might have been early in season three but yeah it, it was the first time the Borg were were shown the Q who yeah because you sent them to the other to the Delta Quadrant. So, so the writers and the producers that worked on that episode, um, like, like anyone doubts me, seriously, it's a simple Google search. It was like really fascinating looking this up. Um, that whole conspiracy thing was actually supposed to be the lead into the Borg, and they just dropped that idea. Yeah. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got. I got. I was turning my phone off because I got a text, so I got distracted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so the whole um, the conspiracy, all that was actually supposed to be the lead into the Borg, but they decided that then in season two, the writers and producers and figuring out the idea of the Borg, they decided they wanted to go the more of let's be quite frank, um, Cybermen. Uh, right. Um, version instead of the parasite thing. So this whole parasite thing got left as this hanging point in the Star Trek mythos, which incidentally enough, I think makes that episode all the more horrific because if you just have, look at Star Trek continuity in what we see in the episodes, you have this one of this invading alien parasite that got close enough in to essentially take over some of the highest ranks of Starfleet and they just disappeared and no one knows where they are. Like that's way more terrifying. That they could come back at any time. Yeah. Which they could so, come back at any time. Funny because I've, I've, you know, recently with Picard, there have been some fans that have complained about like the, that the, that Starfleet would be in, such or would be in such shambles and whatever and it's like and they were like Roddenberry would never do that well Roddenberry kind of did already <laughs> once with conspiracy and yeah, oh, 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 oh yes and we've also talked about um, off recording a lot that 
the whole point of how humanity gets to Star Trek is for humanity to be in shambles, which is something we'll talk about at a later date. Yeah, and and and, and I don't think that it's that far off from 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 what we're seeing with the synthetic storyline that um, is kind of tying um, unintentionally Discovery season two with Picard, and. Um, you know, they could have done the same kind of thing with Conspiracy, and it would be nice to see that storyline come back. It could, if it was done right. So, um, but so I was also looking up over that Conspiracy storyline. Do you know what happened to that with the extended universes? Um, not off the top of my head. I know that there well, was there there was something that they, they did. Yes. Yeah, so I was looking this up over Curious... Um, uh, I, I, I am not really that big of an extended universe when it comes to media type of person. So I went listening to this. If I get some of the details wrong and you're super into it, please let me know. I'm just trying to do the best I can. Uh, but what I can gather from it is that there was uh, three Star Trek novels and a comic book series that mm -hmm. all dealt with the aliens from the conspiracy series. And they tied them into, they were actually an offshoot of the symbiotic species of the Trill. Mm -hmm. That yeah. just says the Vulcans... And the Romulans, Romulans have their awesome. own separate thing. Yeah. The idea is that the trail went one way and the parasites that we see in Conspiracy. Forgive me, um, there is a name, but I, I, I just didn't get it. I'm yeah. sorry. But they went off in their own way. It's a similar thing. Do you know who wrote those novels? Oh, um, yes. They were written by um, ha! Christopher Pike. <laughs> yes, Christopher Pike, the young adult horror author. He's who wrote that. Interesting. All right. So, um, yeah. So that's. I think that's good for Next Gen. I think Next Gen did uh, some stuff. I don't think that they were. I, I think the the Night Terrors episode, the Phantasm one, the the one with the the oh, Riker. I, I have one other Next Gen horror episode that I'd really like to talk about. If sure. you'd be okay with that. Go, 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 go for it. What I, I, um, I, oh, God damn it. So, uh, there's another episode of uh, Next Gen, which is not commonly viewed as a horror episode, even though the name of it is realm of fear and that's the barkley episode where he's afraid of using the transporters oh and with that with the microbes and the he, he yeah exactly and there's the other away team that's actually lost in the transporter like techno babble continuum that's appearing as like ghost monsters and he's afraid of it and i until just this year i've been terrified of flying and so seeing barkley go through the terror of having the transport actually reminds me a lot of my own fears of flying and him getting over it reminds me of my own getting over fears of flying. Well, and it also had, it, it really calls back to From Beyond, um, the Stuart Gordon Lovecraft. Uh, yes. Adam yes, yes, with the things in the other. Yeah, when, yes. when, he, when he sees the realms, it, it, it always reminded me of From Beyond. It's a very, and that episode of with Barkley is very Lovecraftian, even though it doesn't shout the great old ones like the other episodes we're talking about but that thing of like there's other dimensions that are just as and relevant around us around you all the time that you can and it's exactly like from beyond yeah and i feel that episode is a very horror episode that actually and it's called realm of fear but it's about fear of transportation and like you no know, i had fear of flying i'm very happy to say i've gotten over that by now but that that's what the episode's about with him. 
Yeah, and I wouldn't I wouldn't have thought of that, and I didn't see that. I, I I read a bunch of the lists that people had made of horror episodes, and I didn't really see that one. On no one ever names that episode, but that's actually because, like, in the opening of the episode, him being terrified to get transported, and then when he's going through it, and you see it from his perspective, that episode is actually the first time you ever see in all of Star Trek a first-person perspective of what it's like to be transported. And mm -hmm. so you're seeing it through his eyes for the very first time ever in the franchise, and he's seeing monsters when it happens. Like, that's fucking terrifying. Yeah. And um, so I'm going to try right. to both of our favorites of, of Star Trek series of all time, which is, of course, Deep Space Nine. The best Star Trek show ever. Yeah. Yes. So, yes, Deep Space, I mean, we could probably do a whole thing about just, like, why Deep Space Nine is, is the best. But every, every episode I'm ever going to be on this show with you is going to involve us talking about why Deep Space Nine is better than all the other shows. <laughs> At some point. However, yes. Deep Space Nine did not do quite as many horror episodes as some of the other no. shows. No. No. But when they did, they, of course, did it awesome. Uh, one thing that I would notice as far as um, we talked earlier about the original series hiring uh, well-known horror writers, I have to yeah. give a shout out to Deep Space Nine for hiring um, uh, my favorite uh, writer and, um, and a local for you, um, which is John Shirley wrote an episode. Oh, yes. Yes, of Deep Space Nine called Visionary, which is uh, an O'Brien episode. It's very um, Philip K. Dick-ish, um, but it also has its kind of like weird horror elements. And uh, John Shirley wrote my favorite horror novel of all time, Wet Bones. So uh, I just want to give a shout out yeah. to And John. Kevin O'Donoghue also says that as well. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Wet Bones is uh, one of Cody Goodfellow's favorites. Anthony Trevino, we all uh, sing the praises of Wet Bones for being this incredible, batshit, crazy horror novel about uh, drug addiction. And uh, but, anyways, he wrote it. He wrote a Twilight, or not Twilight Zone, uh, Deep Space Nine. But uh, Deep Space Nine did do a few kind of horrific el um, uh, episodes. However, to me. One of the best episodes of Star Trek horror um, revolves around my absolute favorite character from Deep Space Nine, and that's Elam Garrick, uh, Cardassian spy Taylor, um, who is absolutely my favorite character from Star Trek. Um, and there's an episode called Empak Noor. Yes, Empak Noor is absolutely amazing. Yes, and it's basically a slasher, a Star Trek slasher film uh, set in Deep Space Nine with where where uh, Garrick, they're basically on this, and it's a great battle episode because all they had to do was use the Deep Space Nine sets to go to um, Empak Noor, which is another uh, Cardassian space station because they have to get some kind of piece of something to fix Quark's bar. And when they get there, and I rewatched this episode because... It's Deep Space Nine, and why not? And um, but once they get there, they open these frozen tombs with the, have these Cardassians that were put into these stasis chambers because some kind of virus got aboard the space station and made everyone start killing each other, and that's why they abandoned the station. Yes, and and, and it directly. Um, so so I was just like reviewing it. It also like directly impacts our. Uh, Cardassians. Yeah, and so Garrick becomes uh, he gets this insatiable bloodlust and basically starts killing everyone on the station. It's when, and one of the things I love about this episode is that we've always known that Garrick was something more than he said he was, but this yes. is the episode where you get to see him just plow through Starfleet security officers and starts hanging them up putting them, like, hanging their bodies all over, like, the place. Um, and you also get to see Andrew Robinson, who played Garrick, uh, really... Who, by the way, his first major role was playing a serial killer in Dirty Harry. 
Um, his oh shit, really? That was him? Yeah, yeah. He played this. I Tokyo did not know that. In um, in the in the first Dirty Harry movie. Wow, I I I I seen there. I I did not put that together. I had no idea. Now you're gonna want to go back and watch it. Trust yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also, he was the father in Hellraiser, but he didn't. He wasn't playing a. That, that I knew. That I knew because Hellraiser is one of my absolute favorite movies. Yeah, me too. But I had no idea of the Dirty Harry uh, uh, connection. Yeah, that was his first big role, and uh, and for a long time he was worried that he was typecast as playing psychopaths because he couldn't get any other roles. So, huh. um, but uh, so we get to really see that. There, there, there was a bit of me that worried when I watched it that um, O'Brien was a little bit too forgiving <laughs> of, of, of Garrick. Although he does say, um, yeah, no offense, bud, but the plan was to kill you, <laughs> you know, when he, when he, when he well, stops him. I, but yeah, I, I loved the scene where Garrick shows remorse at the very end. Like he knows what he did and it was awful. And, you know, he says, I, you know, that's a great scene, a great Garrick scene. The episode is scary. It's frightening, especially because I think horror is always best when you have a really good um, surrogate that you care about. And I think everybody loved Nog. And Nog seems, even though he has a phaser rifle, he seems so small and helpless. And so I think Nog being in danger and Garrick taking him makes the episode better see um it, and it's really funny you should bring up nog uh in that because what i really want to say in response to that is that what we see in deep space nine of moving past original series and next gen is that the horror becomes less genre horror related in terms of the concepts of ghouls and ghosts and goblins or things like that and the horror starts turning into a real world thing which is what makes yeah, the space the Cardassians on Bajor yes yes and the war that we see and that Nog we end up seeing go through the horror of leg. losing a limb going through PD PTSD um, in an episode and, that John Ordover wrote by the way and I would not consider that horror, but I would say that because I because this is for anyone that isn't aware of David and I's relationship, <laughs> we have a big difference in what we consider part of the horror genre or not, and we get into these big. I've considered starting over. a podcast that's just you and me arguing yes, about what's Yes, up. David and I could just do like a multi-hundreds of hours podcast of us arguing what is horror genre or not. But, but I'm not trying to get into that. But what I'm saying is what Deep Space Nine then did is that it moves it from kind of the genre component of the thing in terms of the real world horror mm -hmm. thing. And that, like, that would be its own episode is what Deep Space Nine did with real world horror. Yeah. And, it's, and one of the problems I have with modern Trek is that, and I don't have many problems. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of the new Star Trek series. But, I've, been enjoy, I've been enjoying them. Yeah, but one thing that I think Picard does a great job of hinting at the stresses that the Federation and Starfleet are going through. And it makes sense because they overreached in trying to save the Romulans. But at the same time, you survive two Borg invasions in the Dominion War. That should be a part of the factor of why the Starfleet and the Federation is struggling I, to hold itself together. It, I, I have, I, I'll be 100% honest, I have not seen Picard yet. I've watched Discovery, but, and I've also watched Short Treks, but I have not seen Picard yet. Oh, uh, is. I'm, be, I'm behind. He I'm would behind. tell you, you gotta unfuck that. Cause yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, I, w I will unfuck that. Yeah. But I will say up to this point, 
Deep Space Nine, in terms of like the actual horrors of what the Star Trek universe would look like, like Deep Space Nine is what demonstrates that the well, best in terms place. of all the most difficult conversations, difficult perspectives, difficult positions everyone be put in. Like there's no such thing as a utopia. And like one of my favorite things I've always liked thinking about is that what Deep Space Nine showed is while well, the next generation crew is like just shipping around thinking like, yay, we're the very best. We're like the um, except for Warp. Uh, you know, like except for Warp, except for Warp and, and Barkley. Actually Barkley also ended up on like, other Warp ships is as well. Like the worst dad ever. And like <laughs> he's just terrible. He's awful. Hey, uh, but though then there's O'Brien. O'Brien is just a shit show horror story in Star Trek. Yeah, a lot of bad stuff happens to O'Brien. Um, but I, I will say, Deep Space Nine, a lot of that comes from the fact that Deep Space Nine takes place on the frontier. Yes. And and, uh, and it's not, like, in the central part of the Federation and all that. And that's interesting, too. But, um, I mean, I could go on about Deep Space Nine, but... Um, and, and uh, I, I feel like that's another episode conversation for us. Yeah, like, yeah. At some point, I feel like we're starting to reach the end of, in terms of all the uh, horror things. Ah. That about, unless there was something else you would like to bring up. Uh, hold on one second. Well, um, there. I actually think Voyager did more um, horror episodes than Deep Space Nine. Um, I didn't do as much research into the Voyager episodes. There is the Haunting of Deck 12 episode, yeah. which which is Neelix telling a ghost story, um, which I liked the idea of. I just didn't think Neelix, who's not from Earth, was the was the correct choice to tell that story. Well, well um, my, I, I, I've, I've seen the episode. I think it's actually a really shitty episode. I, I've yeah. seen every episode of Voyager. Um, I, I've seen every episode except for what I acknowledge earlier of I actually just haven't watched Picard yet. That's actually all I haven't seen. I just need to get on that. I'm David shaking his finger at me. I gotta do I gotta get on it. I gotta get on it. But I've seen every episode of every other show. Um, but one thing I do like about Voyager is I wanna tie it back to like an earlier thing in our conversation, is they did do well the um, idea of like when being approached with the unknown, it being kind of presented in like a horrific dark way because that's always how it's going to come across in what real life. Like I was, I was, I was also tying this back to um, also why I compare Star Trek and Doctor Who together mm -hmm. is that when you encounter this new unknown thing it's always going to be scary and star trek voyager despite like all the critiques i have of it and um i do think there is some like really good episodes of star trek voyager but overall i, I don't rate it very high I, um, I like voyager i just don't think that for the purpose of this episode that they that Horror was their strong suit. Um, it, it wasn't, but they did play on it a lot in pretty much the opening of almost every episode because they were in an unknown area of space. And that's also showing, like, really cool about, like, how Star Trek, just as, like, with Doctor Who, would blur, blur together the genre divides. The, the genre divides aren't as clear as everyone wants them yeah, uh, what's the thing about them being? And I want to move on to some things. Um, uh, Enterprise yeah. did do a Vulcan Zombies episode. Um, I was wondering if we were going to talk about that. I was wondering. Yes. Um, uh, uh, I, 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 I'm not really a fan. <laughs> I'm not really a fan either. The thing about Enterprise is that I, I'm very specific in that I think season one of Enterprise is okay. Season three of Enterprise is very good, and seasons two and four are awful uh, for Enterprise. I, I actually kind of agree with you on that. Um, 
uh, uh, it's it's weird how like inconsistent the show was. I they did they had specific problems in seasons two and four. Like for one thing, like the the Vulcan nymphomania in se- in, in season two of of Enterprise was every episode. So Paul wanted to um, take her clothes off for some reason. It was just sexist and awful, and 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 I just couldn't get with it. But and I don't really think that for the purposes of this episode, I don't think Enterprise really did horror. Uh, very, very yeah, yeah, that's so. kind of what I'm gonna say. Is actually like like for the purposes this episode, I, I had my thoughts on Enterprise, but they actually never really approached anything related to horror, yeah, as far as I'm a, aware of. Yeah. All right. So we're almost we're almost done, but I did want to talk about. Um, yes. Uh, hold on one second. It's all. It, it's all. Right. all so we're back on. There's some activity going on in the house, so sorry if, if there's some noise. But moving on from Enterprise, I did want to talk about, uh, I just wanted to briefly introduce some really important expanded universe attempts at doing horror in Star Trek and get your thoughts on them. There was uh, two novels by a tie-in writer named uh, J.M. Dillard. It was a pen name for another for a writer I don't know what her non-Star Trek books are published under, but she wrote a Lovecraftian horror novel, a uh, Star Trek novel called Demons, and the plot is very Lovecraftian. It says, long before the Federation, a powerful force invaded our galaxy and almost destroyed it, a force that began with possession and madness and ended in murder. And there was a sequel to Demons that was written as a TNG novel um i which i have not read but i know it has something to do with a vulcan um research station that sounds pretty interesting i read it long ago but i don't remember it very well yeah i'm i'm not familiar with this at all i have a i have a very uh limited exposure to the um star trek like extended universe i've only read like a couple comic books like as in like 20 comic books total and most of which was from the new um or relatively new it was either boom or idw i actually don't yeah. recall well, but i actually a hundred of these and one one of them and then and then also as i uh i don't know if i actually said this on the air or not or but i know we were talking about it off recording that the only like Star Trek books I read were the um, Invasion and Day of yeah, Honor series, which were overseen by friend of this show. What was his name? John J. Ordover. Yeah, I give him a shout out. Yeah, those books were awesome. So J. M. Dillard also wrote a Star Trek novel that was a straight up vampire novel called Bloodthirst. No shit, I had no idea. Yeah, a, a class one medical emergency summons the Enterprise to a Federation outpost. There, a grisly surprise awaits them. Two of the lab's researchers are dead. Their bodies drained entirely of blood. No clues, no records of the research, no remnants of their work. And yeah, and they bring back uh, the virus to um, the Enterprise, and they're all like trying to eat, suck each other's blood. I read that many a long time ago. It's pretty good. It's fun. It's not like super high class. The very first um, uh, TNG novel was by Diane Carey and was called Ghost Ship. And one of the things that's interesting about it is she wrote it with only having read the Bible for Next Generation. And so it's a really really interesting read because um, she had no idea what the characters were like. And so it's a really kind of anachronistic, weird um, Star Trek novel. And then Diane Carey also wrote a Deep Space Nine horror novel called Station Rage. Mm, yes, I was. I actually was hearing about this one and looking up Star Trek and horror online. Yeah. So, can you can you give me like some more info on this? So they basically find some sarcophaguses inside Deep Space Nine that have like um, zombie like rage driven like 28 days later like Cardassian soldiers that they awaken from the dead and they're like kind of ripping through the station it's really good 
It's really good. It, I, re- it? I remember that one as being very good. Uh, that is a Ordover era of Star Trek. The, the, the two that we talked about before were before Ordover, um, but uh, Station Rage was during his his uh, reign as editor. So, all right. So now our last segment. I want to okay, talk- our last segment. <laughs> what is it? I want to talk about what we would do. Oh, okay. Uh, for okay. Star Trek Horror. Now, you could do a book um, anywhere in the Trek canon, or you could pitch um, an episode of the Pike show Strange New Worlds. With oh. Original Enterprise. That's the rules of this. Okay. Okay, I know. I want to do a, uh, a a book in the canon. I know. I know that. I know that. I know that. Okay. Um, oh, you oh my go God. first, or should I go first? Um, you go first because I have like five different things. I'm immediately popping out of my head. And well, this might not seem stunningly original, coming right after uh, talking about Jam Dillard's um, bloodthirst but i think we're way overdue for an actual star trek vampire episode since we started with the man trap and i like the idea of the enterprise under captain pike showing up to a tidally locked world where there's a night side and a day side that it's like permanently trapped and and title title lock so um there's this region between the two um, sides of the planet that's like the Terminator where uh, night and day meet and the, the um, two species don't get along with each other, the, two, the people on the two sides of the planet and the vampires from the night side are stealing people from the day side and the Enterprise is sent to make peace and I think um, one of the vampires getting on board the ship would be super fun. The other thing you could do is if you wanted to get really epic with it, you could tie the history of the people on this planet to myths and lore of vampires on Earth. And that would be fun and the kind of thing that Star Trek does not do enough now. Yes, yeah. Is, is to do the kind of hokey fun um like creative things with like mythology which so, doctor who actually excels at of here's the stupid science fiction connection to the yeah mythological which USA, i is, or um, american or uh, european thing whatever whatever yeah now i admit it's a little goofy but i actually think that we need a little bit more goofy right now and 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 pike the pike show if they if they are going to do some standalone episodes, is the time to. Well, when is the Pike Show supposed to be taking place in? Um, we don't know exactly, but it is during um, Spock and Pike's mission. I believe it takes place after the events of Discovery season two, but before Kirk. So between the events of Discovery season two and and the original series. All right, is it my turn to give my pitch? Sure. Are you going to do a book? Well, I, I, I'm not sure because I think it might be able to work as a as, as a pitch during the Pike thing, but I'm not entirely sure. But I, I'm I'm not a big continuity person. Is I I view I'm sorry for everyone like carrying I'll this. I'll be if I need uh, to. Like, like I I view continuity as kind of like overrated. Continuity only works if it helps to make the story better. So. What I am picturing is because I'm supposed to be doing the horror thing here and trying to come up with like one of the things I was like about like Star Trek that we didn't, we still only like hinted at and we're going to be talking about more in later episodes is how awful politics and situation of living went for humans on earth before the federation of plants happened Mm -hmm. and so after that i like to think that like for other planets things continue to not go that well and so you know how we have the idea of like the dust bowl and the locust swarms that happened Mm -hmm. what about like 
triple swarms. <laughs> and I knew you were gonna want to do some kind of triple thing. And because like they be like how they were depicted in the original series, I'm actually not a big fan of in the short tricks what they did with the tribbles. Did you see that? Short? Yeah, yeah. I, I loved um, the Lita Battle Angel uh, lady. The um, I thought she was great in the episode. Oh no! All the um, all the actors were incredible. Even like like the guy that was like the mad scientist nerd guy that was accidentally making the tribbles. He was phenomenal. I just didn't really like that. So you um, like to see the Tribbles as an ecological scourge. Yes. The, I, I like to view them as a locust. And, like, I would actually like to see a Tribbles horror thing over waves of Tribbles going over the lands. How bleak and horrific that would be. Like, have you ever seen the British movie Threads? about what nuclear devastate nuclear war and the devastation of it would look like that's what would tribbles rolling over the ground would actually look like we like to joke about them we like to laugh about them i have some like squishy tribbles around me but if there were millions of them rolling across that would just cause mass starvation mass government upheavals like it'd be unparalleled that's what i want to see i want to see the ecological disaster movie of the fucking tribbles all right so if you're gonna do that i think you have to start <laughs> from the ecological disaster and not know in the beginning what's causing it oh i agree i agree and then the ship shows up, and then it's like, really? It's, it's tribbles. tribbles. It's, it's tribbles. The, the, the tribbles are swarming. We've never seen tribbles actually swarm. Mm -hmm. All the right. Tribbles so, are swarming. <laughs> some other things that I would like to, I think, um, well, it's hard because we want to we want to see some horror tropes that we haven't seen before. Um, I think. Uh, going more Lovecraftian would be great. I would love to see, and I know this is kind of weird. Like, this is kind of going beyond the, uh, like, I think one of the things with CBS All Access is they could do Trek miniseries now. They could just do them at any point. And I would love to see a science vessel crew that um, is, that basically has to, that deals with the awe and the amazing craziness of the full depths of space with something that's yes. more. Yes. Yes. No. No. Uh, no. no, no. Build directly on with Lovecraftian themes of cosmic horror. No, but, but build directly on top of that. Of like that's one of the great things about like Star Trek, and that I really wish it was the franchise was being taken advantage of more is that by the very nature of it, it's uh, unlike Star Wars, that's not just one family that is the entire story. It's a actual universe. It's an actual timeline of events is what Star Trek is. And so, therefore, you can have ships showing different perspectives of this world. And as we've already been talking about, like, Cosmic horror has been alluded to in the very beginning. Like, um, you didn't. I don't believe, I don't believe you said. I don't believe you said it. But like, think about like a Star Trek version of the X Files. How fucking cool that would be. Well, I think they're kind of building to that with Section Thirty One. Uh, I I'm I don't know. I'm I'm kind of hoping so, but we'll see. Yeah. So. Um, all right, so uh, what what if, what has Star Trek missed? We, we know that they haven't done Cosmic Core. It's been a while since they've done Vampires. So are we thinking we need some... We need... We've kind of done the Haunted House thing with, like, haunted ships and, like, the things like that. I'm wondering, if there, are there any tropes that, that we're missing and, and we're not going to do a Star Trek version of a Serbian film? Uh, <laughs> that's just not going to happen. Um... <laughs> 
<laughs> there's no, not going to be any uh, anything that graphic, I think. In Star well, I mean, I mean, I have something just as dark to say. Okay. Do we have a Star Trek example of a mass shooting? Because I can't think of one off the top of my head. I mean, it's just off the top of my well, head, so it may be something well, I'm overlooking. Well, I mean, uh, you haven't seen Picard yet, so... Uh, I have not seen Picard yet, so actually yeah. Picard... Um, it's I, not I really can't... a mass shooting, but there is like a, a kind of... Oh, oh, or... I did. I have not seen it, but I, I, I have heard hints of what... I don't understand it yet because I haven't seen it. But I have heard something about what you're talking about. But like, um, but but um, I, I think what you're saying too is is I think we could see, um, we could see something from that perspective of somebody we haven't really seen somebody kind of lose it on the ship, um, and and like I I've been saying for a long time that it would be very boring existence living on the Enterprise most of the time. There would be long stretches of time where you'd just be traveling bored uh, between one place and another. And um, I know that the spec script that I'm, I'm working on deals with that because part of the whole thing with the, with the episode that I want to write is that it's about how they have to go answer a distress call that takes forever for them to answer it. So there's like all this time between when they get the call and when they respond to it and what what are they doing, what's happening on the ship, that kind of thing. And I, I so I think what you're saying is interesting because we haven't really seen somebody just lose it and want to take down the crew. <laughs> the crew. We, we've seen hints at it, which is with the like Maquis being uh, really explored in deep space nine but um outside of that we haven't really seen the people go at the powers that be even though star trek is constantly dancing around the concept that that, that happened and it was violent well yeah and and i do think which is also weird, like like coming around saying this right now, where I'm in Portland, Oregon right now, where I believe tonight will be night 53 in a row of protests that depending upon how the cops decide to define them are either peaceful or violent riots. Who fucking knows? And it's starting to look like some of those scenes in... Um, the Star Trek episodes when they show what the class right. of, yeah. of humanity looked like before the World War Three. The Deep Space Nine past tense, the, the Bell Riots. Yeah. yeah. We're kind of getting, we're having vans, unmarked vans of unmarked, uh, um, uh, unmarked, law enforcement people grabbing people off the street. This is being very heavily doc documented. And that's literally happening over the past two nights and it's going to happen tonight. And that's kind of the things that leads into a lot of the horror stories in Deep Space Nine. Right. Well, and, and without getting into that, I will say that I do think that you came up with something there. I think I actually just recently wrote a, a short story called Among Us that is about um, the, the AI on a ship figuring out that, or well, it's about the captain of a, of a ship waking up and finding out that one of their, their space trucker crew of eight um, is a serial killer and killed someone on one of the planets they were on. And they don't know who of the, of the eight is the killer. And if I was being really Robert Block, I could adapt that into a to a Star Trek episode because you know that would be really interesting. Is what if the Enterprise left a planet and then found out that one of the crew members, but they don't know who, was accused of this horrible crime? And what if it was their job on the Enterprise suddenly to? I mean, can you imagine like Kirk or Pike or whoever is the captain at that time, like having to solve a mystery and find out like. I have a killer on board my ship, which is kind of like Wolf in the Fold, but 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 more of a mystery, you know. 
That would be interesting. That would be a really interesting Star Trek. I don't know if Star Trek would do it, um, <laughs> but uh, you know that, that the serial killer mystery on board the Enterprise would be would be kind of fascinating. I would totally be down for Star Trek serial killer story. Because you like, know that sounds like something that would be like a a ton of fun and like a great super dark murder mystery. Yeah, and, and and like come on now, somebody got into Starfleet and was a bad person. <laughs> you know? I mean hell, we've seen in I mean we've seen a lot of the stuff, like there's a lot of bad people who did a lot of bad things that made it through mm. Starfleet. All right, so uh Jeff, uh yes. I'm gonna start We've been going for a while. Yeah, we've been going for a while, so we're, we're I think we're ready to wrap up. But um, but we'll definitely do this again. Um, and uh, and the dogs are starting to fight, so it's a good. I can hear the dogs. <laughs> but um, so what? any last thoughts on uh, Star Trek and horror that you uh, want to leave the listeners with? <laughs> Yes, I do. And this is perhaps going to be something that we'll be exploring on a later episode. The real horror of Star Trek is the meme that is going around that's saying, like, if only Star Trek would have left us directions to how to get to the peaceful future. Well, that peaceful future happens through concentration camps, widespread shutdowns of all human rights, um, uh, massive unemployment, uh, genocide, and a World War III that everything that can possibly wrong, go wrong does go wrong. And, so uh, and that's my ending no note, is that if you're looking for Star Trek for a hope for the future, actually, quite frankly, that's the that's last horror note. Star Trek offers no hope for the future. <laughs> All right. On that note, um, well, Jeff, it was great talking Star Trek with you. Um, and uh, um, we're going to uh, sign off from the recording now, but I'll stick around and talk to you for a minute. But uh, thanks for joining Star Trek Story, Myth, and Arcs. <laughs>